right, guys, welcome to another episode here of the Vital Tradition Podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking cold water, and um, we're in the Northern Hemisphere here, but we're going to try and make sure that the episode contains some stuff that uh, has both hard water and open water uh, for those of you that don't ice fish. So um, with that, let's just jump right in. We got uh, myself, Dustin Murphy here, and uh, my brother, Alex Murphy. We're going to hash it out. We're a couple states away. And, you know, usually, Alex, you don't really have much ice. So um, normally we're having different conversations this time of year, but uh, with the polar vortex swinging through again here, you're getting out on as much ice as I am, it seems like. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right about that. We've been blessed. Uh, and I say blessed because uh, you're right. This is a very rare occurrence. So we're actually lucky enough to have cold enough temps for long enough that some of the moving bodies water around here are, are freezing up. And I'm looking to uh, do a little fishing on some uh, on a creek that's nearby that has a, a slough that's probably five or six feet deep, kind of at its deepest along the, the main river channel. And really looking forward to exploring that water because I just found out about it last weekend, really, on a scouting trip. So looking forward to putting some drill in the ice. That's awesome. What Did you have any idea what kind of uh, species you might run into? Uh, I think um, the majority of the stuff is warm water. So stuff like smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, um, crappie, bluegill, channel cats. Uh, there's probably some flathead cats in there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of suckers and minnows and of those other, you know, less targeted species, but certainly still worth pursuing. And of course, I'm really excited. Uh, I'm, I have caught a good number of carp out of this flow before, and I would be really pumped because I've never caught one through the ice. So it'd be yeah. great to get a carp through the ice. That would be pretty fun. What, um, kind of toothy critters you got in there I, I didn't hear you mention any do you have or did you say northern or musky you know this stretch uh around me doesn't have many big toothy critters um up in the headwaters there's some pickerel actually one of the few places uh in ohio that has some <clears throat> i can't remember if it's chain or grass pickerel which species it is but they're kind of up in the headwaters um and pickerel are really the, the small members of that family the musky and pike family um down in the lower stretches where it connects to the to the Scioto river you have uh a small population of muskies some are coming in from their escapees from the impoundment i mentioned in the last episode that's kind of on the north side of town they escape downstream and they're just kind of existing there and there's also some that's migrated their way up from the ohio river kind of coming at it in opposite directions so uh, in this local creek though there really isn't much okay Gotcha. So you're really kind of, you're targeting more of multi-species than, you know, like say people that put out tip-ups for specifically for Northerns or something. You know, I thought about doing that and in terms of setting out tip-ups, um, you could do that for bass. Certainly the small house would probably be a good target for that. I have to find a local bait shop first because the normal waters that I would throw my minnow trap in are frozen over. So uh, they have to get my hands on some bait, but absolutely <laughs> small mouths, large mouths, even big crappie would probably take down mm. a good sucker. Chub. That's crazy that you have um, a problem finding bait. Like you, the bait shops aren't just, you know, around the corner. <laughs> and maybe that's my inexperience fishing with live bait. I mean, predominantly I'm using artificials and I really haven't explored where, to, where the best place is to find minnows. Um, there are a couple of retailers kind of in the, the middle of town that I could, I'm sure I could find some bait, just nothing out my way. And that just goes to show yeah. uh, kind of the shortage of uh, sportsman goods on the West side of town, on the West side of Columbus. There's plenty on the North side, um, certainly on the South side as well. Just, just not out West. So what about you? Yeah, uh, interesting. It, it sounds like uh, we've seen a number of your efforts on YouTube. If you haven't checked them out, check out the vital tradition <laughs> YouTube channel and see all the stuff that Dustin's been doing on the ice. It seems like he's been going after all sorts of bites. So what kind of stuff have you been getting into? Yeah, that's, I'm trying to make a go there on the channel get some content out. Um, you know, I'm as the theme of the channel is being a beginner in the outdoors, you know, I'm a beginner to the self-filming thing, both hunting and fishing. So, 
I'm kind of learning as I go as well. Um, I've edited some video in the past, but, and some audio, but um, the whole thing is kind of a learning process, which is really fun. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're getting going. We've got some ice fishing videos up. We've got a couple more in the bank. Um, so far it's been a slow bite here in Madison, but um Found a couple perch, um, some deeper water perch bites, um, found plenty of bluegills, uh, but none that really want to play ball. I mean, most people I'm talking to um, on the handful of trips I went out earlier in the year were getting like one decent fish an hour. I mean, marking tons of fish on the graph, but just a lot of window shoppers, not... Uh, coming by and you get those hungry schools and, you know, getting limits and, you know, all that fun stuff. So it has been slower, but yeah. So pan fit, pan fish, I do a lot of, um, a lot of jigging. I, my preference would be to jig, uh, versus tip ups, uh, tip ups have their place. And, uh, I certainly will fish them if I need to, but, um, I would much rather be jigging and using electronics and actively pursuing fish. That's just kind of my style. And, uh, I really like using tungstens, small tungstens for panfish is kind of one of my favorite things to do this time of year. Uh, it's just fun. It's like playing a video game. It keeps you entertained. Even if you're not really catching fish and they're swimming through, you get to kind of play the game, play the puzzle, trying to figure out what gets them to at least react. So if you're not catching them, you can at least see in two dimensions on the helix that I'm using. I'm using a hummingbird helix seven ice. Uh, I believe it's a gen two. I've had it a couple of years and um, it's phenomenal. It's two dimensional sonar. I mentioned that because now they have three dimensional sonar available on uh, multiple platforms. So with the two dimensional, you can see a history on your graph. Uh, of the fish reacting to your bait. And then you can see that uh, with respect to time. So you get a bit of a history of your react or your actions and their reactions. And you can kind of try and put the puzzle together uh, a little bit better than if you're just using a flasher. The nice thing about that hummingbird unit is it does have a split screen mode where it actually converts the sonar return to both a flasher or 2d sonar like you would use in your boat um, so you can actually get the best of both worlds uh, as far as a user experience i will say the caveat to that is it's a digital output uh, and it's converting its sonar return um, so it is slightly slower than a traditional flasher only unit that that sonar is going to be just a touch faster on return and give you a slightly more real-time window of what's going on However, I found it so insignificant of a factor to actually catching fish or converting bites that I think, I think the benefits outweigh the negatives for me. Uh, there's a lot of people that still like using a straight up flasher and that's fine. It catches fish. It's still better than not having any electronics. And that's for sure. What about yourself? What do you like to target when you do have ice to get out on? I know you mentioned you're going to some new water, um, but what's your favorite tactic if you, if you had to pick? Um, so I mean, you brought up a good point. I'm generally not going after fish on the ice. So if I, if it was any other year than this year, I would say at this time of year, I'm a really big fan of targeting sogai, which are a, a hybrid between walleye and sauger that the natural resources department here in Ohio stocks at a number of different lakes, um, and some streams throughout the state. Um, they're a cool water species, so they're not quite cold water adapted like trout um, or some species that are, are super active in colder temps. Um, and I guess when I'm talking about cold water and, and colder temps, I'm really talking about water temperatures anywhere from freezing, so 32 degrees Fahrenheit up to, I mean, and maybe this is different from person to person, but subjectively, I would say probably 50 degrees or so is kind of when the shift happens to a, a different um, activity level for a number of fish, especially the, the warm water fish that call this area home. So the fish that are more active, like saw guy in that temperature range, um, I'm generally looking for them in areas where uh, moving water in particular, in areas that they can hold in some decent concentrations. So 
Uh, this time of year in particular, saw guys, walleye and sauger are usually moving upstream in rivers and, and creeks to spawn. Um, so in rivers and creeks where folks, uh, and by folks, I mean, people have put in dams to either generate electricity or manage waters for flood control. Those walleyes, saugers, and saw guys are, are trapped below that dam and they congregate in pretty large populations. So well, I'm lucky enough to have a couple of dams nearby on some creeks that and rivers that contain saw guy. So I really love to target saw guy below those dams. Um, they're generally really accessible areas. Um, and these areas are safe to access for the most part by foot, unless they're, you know, releasing some water for flood control purposes. Mm -hmm. And they are generally good um, about <laughs> making a lot of noise and notifying folks when they are releasing water. So you, you shouldn't uh, be trapped beneath the dam. It could be quite hazardous if you were, but it's it's pretty safe to get to. There's a good number of saw guy to target, and of course, being a, a river, there's a number of other species that you could run into as bycatch. Uh, probably my favorite is is flathead catfish. They will readily take a lot of the same baits that you use when mm -hmm. you're looking for saw guy. Um, and saw guys are generally swimming closer to the bottom than just purebred walleyes they are like saugers in that regard so you do tend to bump into a number of catfish while you're going after saw guy um so the species saw guy the location probably a river and where on the river generally somewhere they're going to hold in pretty decent concentration so it, especially beneath a dam um, but if you don't have a dam in your area and you're looking to target some saw guys on rivers look for any areas of slack water that haven't frozen over. So a lot of times that's an inside, inside bend in the river or some kind of back eddy um, where the current has pushed, uh, pushed in such a way that there's less current in a particular area and they'll move out of the current and wait for things to just move to them since it's colder and they don't have as much energy to, to do things or to chase bait. They're going to let the food come to them for the most part. Um, so those are some of the areas and uh, fish that I like to target. And when I'm going after saw guy in those situations, generally something that's slower moving, I have kind of a, a two fold approach, I would probably be probably be better served using live bait. So folks that do fish live bait this time of year for walleyes, saw guys and saugers will generally use a jig tipped with a live minnow. And yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of trucking through here, but just to try and give you a whole bunch of information in, in one snippet. Um, yeah, go for it, man. I'm enjoying this. So yeah, you got Jig and a Minnow. I was going to ask you what you've seen guys use for like live bait options. And then what are you using for artificials for people that don't want to use live bait and they, they want to go try this? Sure, sure. Um, so for the folks that are using either live bait or artificials in terms of the presentation people are using for jigs they're generally using uh, uh either a round head or a football head jig in eighth ounce to up to a half an ounce depending on where you're fishing and the current so if you're really trying to get down deep or you're fighting a pretty significant flow then you're going to want to have your jig head to get the bait down in the strike zone since i mentioned saw guy are going to be down near the bottom if you're not if you don't have a heavy enough jig and it's not getting down there, you're not going to be catching fish. Okay. Um, so in that scenario, you are getting down to the bottom and you are going to run into some snags. So pre be prepared to lose some baits. Jigs, thankfully, are pretty inexpensive. So, you know, a lot of folks pretty stock up on quite a number of jigs. Um, so you're usually running a jig head in those weights. I think in terms of color, it's not necessarily as important as the size and the weight of the jig. But if you are looking to kind of fine tune your presentation, maybe they're not going after a particular color. Um, depending on water clarity, I would I would start with uh, maybe a, a chartreuse or a white. If your water is a little clearer um, and if it gets stained or murky, either due to current or due to any other kind of conditions at the time, probably a dark blue, purple, or black would be the way to go in terms of uh, jig head color. Okay. Well, that's a really good um, starting point. Do, do you see, um, do you see guys running like, uh, th like three way rigs or I guess how many lures or hooks could you have on one line uh, for one person fishing? I, I, I've heard of some guys running, you know, multiple jigs or like a three-way rig, 
Can you, can you touch on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So a lot of folks, as you mentioned, do like to switch it up and offer different presentations in one package, so to speak, and also cover different depths in the water column. So where, where it's legal, it's, it's a good tactic for saw guys, for crappie, for a number of species that um, aren't kind of inhibited or by leaders. They're not shy of extra line and uh, kind of up the line, or if water is a little bit murkier. So uh, when folks are doing that, they'll use a, a conventional pickerel rig sometimes, or they'll just tie um, three baits on a line. Here in Ohio, you can have uh, you can have three hooks uh, per line, and you can have two lines in the water. Um, so folks will generally tie different size jigs, kind of uh, heaviest at the bottom, lightest at the top, to try and cover different water columns, or excuse me, different uh, depths in the water column and also to give different changes in size and profile to kind of maximize your, your options there for the fish. Um, I guess in terms of live bait setup, if you're going for saw guys or you're going for other species like that with a jig, I think probably the minnow is the best bet in terms of pairings, but other folks, um, even outside summertime, I know summertime is a really popular time on traditional Northern waters to use leeches. Uh, but leeches certainly could work with a jig, a uh, night crawler, um, certain sections of, and if you're really in really finesse conditions, maybe downsizing to, to wax worms or some kind of other live bait like that would also work. Um, if you're going with an artificial, I would probably recommend some kind of a grub, uh, a curl tail grub or some kind of, um, triple tail grub, something that's going to give it some action without much action on your part, something that's going to keep moving with just the natural flow of the water without you doing much, because without these fish moving much to get the bait, they still want to feel like it's getting away from them in a lot of ways, or that it's, um, uh, something edible that's moving. So anything like that, that will have its own natural action in the water is helpful. So the alternative to doing the plot, the soft plastic route with the jig head is to use, I know it's popular uh, in a lot of Wisconsin flowages, especially as uh, a hair jig. So, so a lot of folks actually tie their own either bucktail or marabou, something that's going to have an undulating kind of natural look to it by just sitting there in the water. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Hair jigs are awesome. Um, you hear about them in pretty much every facet, walleye, community bass community um it's great up on lake michigan for smallies it's yeah it's a fantastic bait for sure um be, before we move on from that really quick um maybe i missed it did you touch on using cut bait at all for the in the live bait section have, have you seen anybody you know bring um either store-bought frozen shad or you know herring or something and and cut it up or even catch fresh sucker and and cut it up out there for i guess at that point you'd be probably targeting the cats but is that have you seen that at all you know i haven't seen that but i'm sure it would work um the you know the cats are motivated by their nose most of the year if not all of the year um so yeah i'm, I'm sure that could work okay yeah and i've got a couple bodies of water around here where you can target some catfish and i've heard of cut bait i've heard of guys using actual chicken livers through the ice as well which is pretty cool uh you know a lot of the stuff you hear during the summertime but it, it's pretty cool when you hear you know in cold water having having people have success so yeah um, you know i i heard from a couple of folks you in particular about a, a pretty interesting catfish bite near you can you talk about that a little bit yeah um there is a catfish bite that was historically amazing um on lake mendota and it's been covered by a few shows i um a couple uh, i yeah, there's a handful of them. I can't remember all month. I think in-depth outdoors was down maybe last year or two years ago, but that wasn't through the ice. They were fishing channels, uh, channel cats on Mendota in the springtime. So like April, May, uh, time period. Um, and then there's been another, I think, uh, babe Winkleman maybe had a show or somebody had a show during the summertime for channel cats, but that has been, uh, years ago. 
Um, a lot of the guys I've talked to now said the bites kind of been overfished. Uh, you're lucky if you catch one, you used to be able to just catch a pile of them cause they'd kind of roam around in pods. The, I guess the, from what I've heard is there's been a problem with catch and release or rather the opposite. A lot of people were catching them and killing them on the ice. Um, you know, you're talking 15 to 25 pound channel cats that are just awesome, crazy, monsters. awesome monsters. Right. And, yeah. um, you get people that say, well, they're ruining the perch and the panfish population. And, um, I, I don't know. I have a hard time believing that the amount of panfish in the Madison systems being decimated by channel catfish. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's just every fishing community has their little sob story about the target fish they like and why it's not doing well or why they can't catch them. And that's just, it is probably always going to be that way. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't done it myself. I'd love to try it. I don't know if I'll be able to do it this year, but yeah, the, the expectations are not what they used to be as far as years ago when you can go. And if you found the spot, you would catch a ton of them, like double digits and they were all big fish. Um, but now it's, yeah, you're lucky if you get one, it's a good day. And that's if you find the spot. So it's still not going to deter me. I'd like to try it. I think it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm not out to eat them, uh, put them right back and, um, just take a quick photo. So, Oh yeah, man. 25 pound channel cat through the ice. Sign me up. That sounds Yeah. Pretty... It does sound pretty fun. Um, so you haven't gotten to fish the, the channel cats through the ice on Mendota. Have you gotten to go after your favorite species this time of year on the ice? Or can you talk about that? Kind of. I, up... I haven't. Yeah. You know, I haven't figured out how to snag shad on a crankbait yet through the ice. So my, <laughs> my favorite species is actually down in that spillway. Oh man. I was hoping you were going to touch on those trophies in there. Possibilities under the, you know, <laughs> under the appalments, you can really get after them with a lipless crank, but no, I haven't, uh, haven't figured that one out yet. Yeah. You know, I, like I said, I kind of like just, I'm a big fan of bluegill fishing and, and pan fishing with tungstens. I really like crappie fishing too. Pretty much crappie, perch, and bluegill. They're all kind of in the same boat. Anything I can be active with the electronics and, and jig, uh, I really like. I'll take toothies, whitefish. It's all, it's all fun. You know, walleyes, it's all fun. But um, there's just something special about getting out after an early ice season you know, bluegill or, or panfish bite. It's, it's pretty special. Well, I was just going to ask you if you could kind of go into that a little bit more. I mean, we, we dove pretty deep into saw guy below spillways on flows and oh, sure. yeah, many yeah, yeah. more pages to write on that story. So maybe you yeah. could just go a little bit into what you're yeah, doing like what on I'm the doing. ice for those. Okay. Yeah. So kind of what I'm doing when I venture out for panfish on the ice, I'm no expert. I'm, I've been kind of tinkering and figuring it out each year as I go. But generally, I'm starting with a tungsten jig in the three to five millimeter size range. I've kind of just by sh like sheer strategy, like I don't have a box of colors. I have a handful of colors and that's it. I, that, I'm not going to have 7,000 colors on, on my person at any point. I've got <laughs> the basics, a white variety which um i like the wonder bread color um i think mine happens to be a glow version of wonder bread i don't know if that's a necessity for for all bites but i know it has worked um, for me in the past i've got some sort of black dark color black or deep purple sometimes you'll see companies run a deep purple instead of a black um, or sometimes they'll have both uh and then some sort of fire tiger like an orange uh, well, I guess those are two different things. Uh, an orange or pink is pretty, um, good in and of itself. And then also a tiger. So a, a combination of green, orange and chartreuse, um, is also an option I have on hand. The other jig I run. So the mainly are I'm running custom jigs and spins tungstens right now. It's what I have on me. They've been working really well. And, um, like I said, I run those basic colors. I'm all, I'm running the check eye tungstens. Um, they've been out for several years and I've had great success with them. Um, but occasionally I'll run into a school of, um, 
Yeah, blue, like pretty much everything. Bluegills, crappie, perch, whatever I'm fishing over top of. That'll either shut down, so they, they didn't really swim off or move, um, but their mood changed uh, since I had been catching them, and the, and they just kind of stopped biting, or they're kind of reacting, but now um, it's just different. But like it's slower, not you know what I mean. So something changed in a negative way uh, for the bite, and that's when I'll like to have a second rod. Uh, rigged up with one of these uh, VMC fly jigs. And what these are, they're they're similar to the tungsten jig, but instead of just having a bare shank hook, uh, they've actually got some, some fly material on it. So whether it's bucktail or marabou, it's, it's, it's small, um, but the purpose um, in combination with that fly tie material and maybe some sort of like hard plastic grub looking body is that you can tip it with live bait, but if you don't, it still functions as a standalone offering for the fish, which is really nice um, for some of these really paper thin spikes and waxies when you get down there and they get pecked a few times and they'll just fall off the hook. You know, if you're down in 30 foot of water with a jig, that's like that big, you know, getting that thing up and down, even with tungsten is going to take some time and the the school may swim off. It's not often that that happens, but there are times where it's like really imperative that you're down there as quick as you can in front of their face. Um, and so to have that confidence that even if, you know, your live bait falls off, you've still got something that you can catch fish on, um, does make the difference some days. So that's a nice little one, two punch. Um, when it's a, when, when like tungsten jigs is, is the ticket. Um, so I like having those two things ready to roll for panfish. So you mentioned, you mentioned having two rods rigged up each with a, a jig. Do you ever mm. run a, a double or a tandem rig? So you have a, a dropper jig beneath another, or is that, um, you know, I may have once and I, it's a great idea and I should do it more often, honestly. I should probably run the fly jig in tandem with one of these tungstens because why not? Like (laughs) (laughs) then you get both. And as long as you, I think part of the issue, uh, well, any, not maybe not part of the issue, but an issue I could see arising is you've got to be cognizant of the size of fish you're after um, the school, like the possibility. So like if you're in a hot and heavy day on, you know, slab crappies or, or big perch you got to be kind of careful uh if you're running two pound fluoro uh as a leader two pound fluorocarbon as a leader and then you decide you want to run two three jigs on the same line and and tie them all in in line together you're going to uh if you get lucky you get three fish on there you're going to have to take into consideration you're going to fight you know three slab crappies on two pound fluoro i mean it's set your drag right it's a good problem to have right yeah it sounds like a good problem to have it also sounds like a great way to lose three slab crappies um yep so it's a little different i think than just straight up saying like an open water you could run a pickle rig or you know the salt water rigs when you go out and you drop into a school giant snap or something you've got three circle hooks and a two ounce sinker it's a little different than that i mean could you apply the same principle Absolutely. And, you know, maybe there is a way to do that. I just haven't thought about it. Um, so I'll do my homework on that and get back to you because that does sound like a really fun mod, uh, especially on those days where you, you don't know yet. So maybe it is one of the, it's like fly fishing where you've got the, the egg and the nymph or the, you know, the top dry fly and, and an egg or, you know, some sort of combination where you're like, you're just trying to figure out what they want to eat. And you're giving them both at the same time. So that's a great thought. I like that. And right. I'm going to do some homework and get back to you on it. Um, I, you know, I'm at the same time going to do the exact same homework because honestly, I haven't done enough of what you're talking about in, in terms of having two rigs um, active at the same time. So a lot of folks that um, are in the know, you like to run 
one rod that has kind of a, a finesse quote unquote presentation. So a tungsten jig or something smaller in profile that's not as flashy or not as loud. That's going to get fish that are a little more neutral um, to negative mood. Uh, and then they have an attractor set up either a spoon or a lipless crank or something like that. That's going to try and draw the fish in. So I'm going to try doing that myself. I saw it work for fly fishermen. I was like, Hey, maybe that's a good idea, but I haven't tried it yet. So I'm going to do it too. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm excited. I do want to try it now. And I think, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take, so I, I usually run an inline reel ice fishing reel. I run a 13 fishing free fall inline reel paired with a tickle stick. And then I have two more 13 fishing, uh, free fall inline reels, uh, on two different, um, like noodle type rods. Uh, one, um, is a noodle rod. My main I know for a while there, you were using a tuned up custom rod. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, I know the initials are T U C <laughs> just like, <I'm> like <laughs> uh, geez. uh, it's been a day, man. Um, so yeah, so my panfish setup right now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my main, like, uh, the one punch, if you will, I'm going to have, um, whatever my confidence bait is it for that day, a single tungsten, you know, ready to rock on my, my main five pound ice braid with like two to three pound floral liter and one tungsten that I know is like, okay, that's, what's working today. And I'm going to have that ready to go. What I'm going to do with the experimental homework we're talking about is I think I'm going to take one of my uh, kids, ugly stick spinning reels, which have, a crazy amount of sensitivity, uh, per backbone for an ice rod and for the cost, uh, it's, it's kind of a really cool combination that I happened upon, um, when I was picking out some ice rods for my, my kids. And I've caught plenty of panfish without a spring bobber on those, which is pretty insane considering, I think they're only, I think it's only a light. I don't even think it's an ultra light ice rod, which is nuts. Yeah. It's a light um, action rod. Yeah. yeah. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to still run five pound power pro ice braid as a backing on that, but instead of two or three pound floral, I'll probably upgrade to four or five, like maybe even five. I might sacrifice some bites on the line diameter, but I think I'm going to run some combination of two lures. And by, I think by putting it on the slightly beefier rod, then maybe I'm kind of justifying, at least in my mind without doing it, that it's going to compensate for that, that potential difference. So you mentioned earlier that the, the bite's been kind of slow out there on the ice and you've been kind of uh, checking out a couple of different spots. Um, in terms of how you're thinking about where to look on the ice, and I understand this is coming from the perspective you lived in the area, roughly in the area, kind of the metro area, a number of years, but this is your first year kind of targeting uh, more in depth, the, the bigger lake in the chain. So when you're looking to scout out a new area, really looking to get on a different bite, what are you, what are you trying to do first? What's your kind of process? Um, yeah, that's, and that's, it's been an evolution and every year I grow a little bit as an angler. I learn some new things. It's the beauty of the internet about fishing with new people, talking with new people, reading new things every year. You're, you're constantly learning. Um, and I, I love that part of it. So kind of where I've come to at this point in my life and in my angling career, uh, I'm way more focused on finding structure and finding fish than I ever was. And I, I feel like that's going to continue to be the forefront, especially on new water or, or trying to find a new bite. Um, if it's, a, I guess, where would you be focusing if that wasn't the, it seems like an obvious statement, but I think as a beginner, you get very often you get hung up on, am I doing the basic stuff, right? Like, am I, is this sled loaded? Right. Am I pulling it? Right. Is this where I walk onto the lake? Um, how far do I walk? Where's the drop off? Do it, you know, especially if you don't run electronics, these are things that you just, 
it's going to be a wild goose chase for, for quite some time. Um, the fastest way to start checking this, these boxes and actually shorten that learning curve is to get yourself a nice auger and a, an a electronic unit, whether it's a, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a basic flasher, you can run any of the brands, mark them, a Vexlar, you know, with a, you know, a Gens pack, uh, or the ice 35, the hummingbird ice, like a basic flasher. And you can find them every single year on sale. I think every single entry level flasher is, is usually on sale between two and 300 bucks every year. I think some hardware store or outdoor store will run a sale where you could probably pick one up for like 250 to 275 bucks. And that's going to be your like entry level unit. That's not, um, like a deeper sonar. So the deeper sonars are like those super portable ones you can keep in your pocket. They run off an app on your phone or your iPad. Um, but generally the battery's a little limited. You've got to have a recharger. Um, so yeah, you could still, that's an option. It's just, um, I, I personally like having the, uh, the carry thing or the carry case on these individual units with a 12 volt battery that especially if it's cold, those batteries do not last long at all. And to, to be basically not able to fish if your batteries die on, you know, a portable unit, it's not awesome. Especially if you're like us, you know, young parents, you don't have all the time in the world. When you do get out, you want to maximize your efficiency and focus on fishing. You don't want to be like screwing around with gear. You know, you want to have that stuff dialed so that you can focus on just trying to catch the fish. I mean, you've got, that's, that's going to be hard enough, especially if you haven't done it very often. The last thing you want to do is to be worried about these variables that you could have worried about before you even got to the ice. So back to the original point, when I'm approaching new water, the best thing to do is to drill holes and look for structure and look for fish and don't stop until you find it. That's the best way you learn. That's the fastest way you get on a bite. And that's one of the first lessons you do learn is it's really easy to walk onto a frozen body of water for the first time, punch a hole and be like, okay, I'm ice fishing. And like literally the novelty, if you haven't done it, you're going to be super, super stoked. Like, yeah, I just dropped a line through ice and I'm fishing and I'm sitting on top of the water. Like that, you know, that might just be, you know, you put your, put your flag into that for the day and you're, you're done. You're like, yep, I'm good, Open man. Beer and is, you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Like great story, man. Like just wait till I tell you what I did today. You know, I sat in a chair and fished through a hole, didn't catch anything, you know, and that's a lot of people's story and that's fine. And that's, yeah, that's where I started the novelty of walking on a frozen body of water and fishing was awesome coming from somewhere where I never ice fished before. But if you really want to catch fish, you've got to figure out where they are. And the nice thing about ice fishing, um, the same body of water over and over again, is once you figure out generally where they go, they go to the same general area every year. So you can really start to fine tune. If you're fishing the same body of water and also years in a row, you can start to fine tune some of the spots they use at different times, different reasons, um, or at least have some backup options. If one bite's not working at one place, you can kind of bum out and check this other one and, Usually you can scramble some fish together over the course of a season. It's not like you're going to get shut out, but going somewhere for the first time as a beginner, the best thing you can do is to punch holes, be mobile and try and find structure. Fish would be better than structure, but the structure is usually going to start to help you find some fish. So if you can find weeds, you know, any sort of vegetation, get on an edge, that's kind of where I'm starting, uh, and even before you get to the lake, I'm starting in bays, uh, with kind of that four, three to four is probably the shallowest I'll go. You can definitely catch fish in three to four foot of water this time of year. Um, especially if there's stuff to hold fish like weeds or other structure. Um, but that three to like 15 feet, so 15 and out, is going to be a little trickier, especially for a beginner. Cause you really do need electronics out there. Like it's, you know, it's not like a big shallow flat. You're probably fishing a contour. Um, the drop-off is going to be pretty significant. 
on some of these basins, depending on where you're at. Um, so like you could take three, three steps and the depth changed, you know, three to five feet, uh, one, one direction or the other, but generally punch some holes, find some fish. And it's going to be almost impossible to do that without electronics. Um, cause you're going to have, if you don't have electronics, then you've got to manually test every hole with live bait. And then if you're not doing the right thing in the beginning, you're never going to be able to like test your theory, like from a scientific standpoint, even if it's not a perfect, perfect experiment, how are you going to get any feedback on whether you're doing the right thing? If you, if you already are doing the wrong thing with your jig or you're using the wrong lure, you're never going to catch fish. Like you have to basically get so lucky that you punched a hole on top of a barrel that was had fish in it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's a puzzle that is, gets a lot easier when you have electronics, especially through the ice. Those are all really good points, especially when you, when you get to the ice for folks that are looking to do a little bit of um, scouting ahead of time, this kind of goes back to our, our first episode talking about how to take on a new body of water, either open water or through the ice. Um, if you have a chance, download the topographic map of whatever body of water you're fishing. So, you know, roughly how deep the water you're going to be fishing. You can pick out some likely areas that the fish are going to be holding in based on that time of year, based on the structure that's present there, based on the species you're targeting. Uh, you can eliminate a lot of water that way, just looking at the maps at home. Um, and then when you get to the water, it, it's helpful to either have the map pulled up on your phone. There are a number of apps out there nowadays. Uh, Lake Master, that's paired with Humminbird typically, um, Lawrence has an app as well that has the, the lake contours of the lake that you're on that you can view with your GPS position. So you can tell whether or not you're on a contour line or not, or if you're way off the mark. Um, so if you have a chance, get the topo maps uh, either on your phone or on paper and try and figure out the areas that those fish are likely going to be holding. Um, and then I think Dave Gens was one of the uh, early pioneers of a method to refine your search. And I haven't tried this yet, um, but I'm dying to do it on this, especially on this new water. But in terms of gridding out likely locations, so maybe you've looked on the map and you've selected, this is a transition area from 15 to 30 feet that happens really quick. And so these fish are going to be moving up and down this um this transition point just because it's so it's so quick they can get back and forth easily um so if you think the fish are going to be there go ahead and drill out a, a grid of holes in a football field size so maybe every uh 25 to 50 feet you're drilling a hole and trying to find either a structure or a fish and then once you've uh, eliminated a certain number of football field size grids you maybe you've found a fish or two or some structure that you want to come back to and figure out in more detail. Then you drill out a smaller grid pattern, um, especially along the contour line, but also in different depths, just to figure out, just to refine your search. So you're starting larger in focus and then getting more granular. Um, so those are probably the, the two things that you can do ahead of time. And then on the water that might also help when uh, processing a new, new bite or a new species. Absolutely. That's a great, great idea. Um, and that's a great thing for beginners to work with because you really don't know the spot at that point, like, unless somebody told you exactly where to go, but eventually you're going to have to do it for yourself. So going to a new body of water, even if you're not a beginner, maybe you're trying a new area. That's a great technique, um, to really just get a starting point so you can start to work the pattern a little bit. Um, another thing we should mention, um, speaking of going to new bodies of water and starting stuff is just basic safety equipment for ice. Um, we touch on it a lot of the YouTube videos. Uh, the first video, I kind of went over how to spud, uh, spud bar, um, a new body of water. If you're ice fishing, um, ice fishing in general has its own, um, safety precautions that you need to take um, similar to open water, but slightly different, um, because of the nature of having to potentially lift yourself out of the ice hole that you fell in and have ice around you and, and sheets above you and cold water and shock. And, uh, you just need to make sure you still have a flotation device on first and foremost, whether it's an actual life jacket or an ice suit, 
one or the other. And then a spud bar is a big steel pole that uh, essentially you need to calibrate to your swing, but you figure out how many inches of ice on um, equals one swing. So you swing your spud bar into the ice. It's like an ice chipper basically. And you, and you stab the ice with it, with a swing. And if you don't go through um, for me, each swing is about two inches. So if I go um, through the ice with my ice chipper after two swings, I know the ice is about four inches thick and I, it's a little variable, but that's just to give you uh, to illustrate the, the, the point here, it's about four inches thick, but that's my swing. So you've got to figure out by going to a body of water that has ice that, you know, you can access safely, whether you're standing on shore and just stabbing ice while standing on land so that you don't have to worry about falling through if it is thin, or you go with somebody who has done it before, and then you just go to learn how to spud. So they'll spud out and make sure the ice is safe. You walk behind them in the same path and you spud along with them. And then they can teach you how um, each swing equates to a thickness of the ice um, until you get confidence in recognizing ice thickness based on your swing. Um, and even then you don't really want to risk it. So if you're not sure, just don't go. Like it's just not worth the risk. Um, uh, you want to have um, spikes or, or uh like cleats, retractable, um, you want to have cleats on your boots to help with traction on the ice from falling and give you grip for pulling equipment. Um, and then you also want to have spikes to get yourself up out of a hole if you were to fall through the ice. And that helps you grab on and pull yourself up out from a hole if you were if you were to fall through. Those spikes are, the spikes are generally lanyard style. So there are a number of them that either are locked together so that the, the, ex, the point is not exposed or they have some mechanism by which they retract. So definitely invest in a good pair of spikes because that's one of the most essential life-saving pieces for when ice fishing in addition to the life jacket. Um, and just a point about the, the spud bar swing. So a lot of folks, uh, myself included, when I got a spud bar, I, I got one this year just because we had decent ice and I was using it for the first time. Um, a lot of folks may not give the swing enough juice. So the, the spud bar itself is generally pretty heavy. It's, you know, 20, yeah, pounds, a good point. Or 20 pounds or more, but don't be ginger with it. Don't just kind of poke at the ice and assume that it doesn't go through that you're fine. Um, you need to give it a, a pretty hefty swing. So don't be afraid. You're not going to break ice that unless you're on really thin stuff that you shouldn't be stepping down on anyways. Right. So make sure you're doing it from shore to get started to establish that, but it, you shouldn't be fissuring ice in any way. It, it should just make a hole and it's not going to generally break out the ice from underneath you unless it's too thin and thus not safe to walk out on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You don't, you're, you're trying to break the ice. That is the point of the spud bar. You want to break the ice and you want to figure out how many swings it takes to do that. Yep. So, uh, you, you're not going to break the ice if you're just gently tapping it. Um, and if you are, then you for sure shouldn't be on the ice. <laughs> right. Oh, but yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And <clears throat> I think at least, you know, in, in the States that do have ice fishing, it is a great way to, it refine your open water skills, open new doors to new techniques that you can apply in all facets of fishing. It never ceases to amaze me the dots you can connect between styles of fishing and seasons of fishing. If for no other reason, go out and try it. If you, especially if you got somebody that knows what they're doing and has asked to take you along, go learn. As a beginner, it just you know it doesn't hurt to. Put it in your back pocket and say, yeah, I've tried it. I don't like it. But if you're like us, it's, it's a lot of fun. We didn't grow up ice fishing and man, I love it. I love it's close quarters. It's at least for me now, like I was mentioning my bread and butter is like, I will, I love sitting in front of the electronics and just playing fish. And it is a lot of fun to do that. Um, and I don't do a whole lot of it in open water. I do some, um, it's just, but it's just different. There's something about it. It's really cool. It's really cool. It is. And I have uh, just one kind of overarching theme for ice fishing. And this is maybe just a, a personal thing, but I like to do, I like to ice fish um, safely, functionally, and comfortably. So 
two of those things can go really hand in hand. Well, I guess all of them can go hand in hand, but in order to kind of maximize your efficiency, your patience, your general happiness when fishing, you need to be comfortable when you're doing it. So I know Dustin, you mentioned this on the previous podcast about hunting gear, but it certainly applies to ice fishing as well. So once you've checked the boxes for safety, you've got your cleats, your spikes, life jacket, that kind of stuff. If you're not comfortable when you're ice fishing, especially you're not going to be on the water long. So you're not going to have the patience or the fortitude to do what you need to do to actually find and then catch fish. So make sure you have, I mean, the, the float suit that you mentioned. So strike master does a good one. Eskimo ice runner. There's any number clam outdoors. They all do good. I think it's striker suits. ice. Oh, striker. That's right. Striker, striker ice. ice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they all do good, a good job of keeping you afloat safety wise, but they also keep you super insulated. I know you said, shoot, you're basically in summer gear, a, a t-shirt and shorts oh, it's, underneath yours. It's unbelievable. When you <clears throat> pair an ice suit with a thermal ice fishing shack, it doesn't matter if it's a shanty, like a pull, a flip over style or a hub. It is insanely comfortable despite the outside temps insane. Like in our last, in the last video I just put up. I had my jacket off hanging up there and I'm sitting in a hooded sweatshirt and I still have steam coming off of me and it's one degree outside, like outside of the shanty, it's one degree. And it's like, I'm very comfortable. Like I would have been sweating with that coat on. It's, it's awesome. It's just such a nice, it's one of those tools that man, in the beginning, could you wear just a regular life jacket? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, I wrote an article on our website. If you are looking to upgrade or get into ice fishing and you, and you can only pull the trigger on, you know, let's say one piece of equipment or maybe two um, in that, like, you know, let's say $500 range, like plus or minus, but let's just say you got one purchase this year and you're going to make it in ice fishing. Um, I think you can't really go wrong with one of three purchases. Um, and I've got them all listed on that article, um, a thermal, um, hub, the ice suit, and then electronics. Um, and that's assuming you have an auger because you could throw uh, an auger in there, man, it, then you're, you're really kind of eliminating, I would eliminate the shanty. And I would actually say, then you, you should rock, um, electron, uh, ice suit first. So safety first. So ice suit first. And then I would go um, electronics because you can always pick up a used hand auger off Craigslist or Facebook marketplace for pretty dang cheap. And I would rather use a hand auger and electronics than a lithium auger and no electronics every day of the week. I would rather drill one hole and know what's down there um, and drill another <laughs> than drill 50 holes and have no idea what's down there. Yep. 100%. <laughs> so um, really, yeah, if you can swing it and you're making that one purchase, the ice suit is paramount. And then electronics is like, you know, if ice suits 1A, electronics are 1B. Uh, it just it just really takes the game to another level. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. So yes, if you haven't checked that, that article out, go check that out. Um, I would agree 100%. So if you're looking to get into ice fishing this year, um, get the safety stuff first, your spud bar spikes cleats that kind of stuff um get yourself something warm so if you're if you don't have a float suit maybe this isn't your year to upgrade make sure you're layering and don't start with a cotton layer the cotton layer is going to make you sweat and sweating is not good when you're in the cold mm -hmm. um you're just gonna uh, you're gonna fizzle out a lot faster so have some kind of base layer that's moisture wicking and then, and then layer on top of that some warmer stuff um so make sure you're safe comfortable and then make sure you're efficient get the electronics they're going to show you where the fish are um and it's experiment with baits until you find something with it that, that works yep no, that's absolutely right and there's plenty of ice uh season left at least up here we've had a nice cold winter um you know usually you can get into march uh toward, getting towards the end of march you could still have ice to fish on depending on where you're at sometimes even into april if you go even further north um, I'm in kind of the Southern part of Wisconsin. So, um, there's plenty of ice up further North than that even later, but, um, yeah, so a little slower this time of year, but there's still ice to be had, especially if you want to try it. And if you don't, at least you can say you tried it and it's one less 
you know, rabbit hole to throw your money down. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. Well, yeah. So check out, um, we've got, uh, content up on Instagram. We've got content on Facebook. Uh, the YouTube channel's pumping. We got a couple of videos out there, um, several more in the bank. So far, it's all ice fishing, but more to come. Um, especially if you're looking to try ice fishing, check out the helpful gear. The first video we released, I, I went through a how-to on um, spudding new water. It actually was early ice for me. So you get to see me spud on four inches of clear ice. Um, got to verify what you know swings were, drilled the hole, took a ruler and you get to see all that in the videos. So check that out if you haven't done it. Um, in a lot of the videos, um, it's a slower bite, not catching a lot of fish, but I do try and walk you guys through what I'm thinking, what I'm trying to do to get fish to bite. And then I'm trying to explain the graph as I'm fishing as well. So if you're looking to learn electronics or you're, if you're in the market of picking a, a unit up, check those videos out so that, um, you can kind of get a hang of how some of that sonar technology works. Um, and it'll just get you, you know, shorten the learning curve that much more for when you do get on fish website. We've got other blog articles. Uh, if you're interested in hunting and fishing, kind of everything's living there. We've got it neatly organized by uh, categories on sub sub pages. So go check that out. And a um, couple how to's for getting started on ice fishing. Like I, I mentioned the equipment, that I would recommend if you're going to upgrade a couple things. Um, I've got an upgrade article there where your money's probably really well spent uh, as far as efficiency on the ice. So, all right, guys, well, that's pretty much it on time here. We kind of chatted a little bit more about ice fishing than I thought we would, but nothing wrong with that. We got uh, plenty more uh, episodes here coming and I'm sure we'll get into some other stuff. So, all right, guys, thanks for tuning in. It's been awesome. It's been fun. Looking forward to getting back out of the ice here after these sub-zero temps and hope you are as well. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and check us out on YouTube.